In this video, we complete our discussion of analog IC biasing references and regulators by focusing on the design of voltage regulators. Whereas reference and bias circuits generally produce voltages from which very little or no current is drawn, voltage regulators are intended primarily to produce voltages from which some significant current is drawn. For example, the supply voltage of a critical analog circuit and sometimes the supply voltage of a biasing circuit where low noise performance is critical. In general, a regulator circuit improves the quality of a DC voltage or current, usually decreasing its noise. Often this is the supply voltage for some critical analog circuit, but it can be any voltage from which a significant amount of current is drawn. The typical scenarios shown here where an overall supply voltage is quite noisy because of other circuits operating under the same supply voltage. A common scenario is on mixed signal integrated circuits where digital and analog circuits coexist under the same supply voltage. Digital circuits are notorious for introducing large transient spikes of current onto the supply, giving rise to a noisy waveform on the supply voltage. Analog circuits may be sensitive to such noisy supply voltages, so a voltage regulator intervenes, accepting as input the noisy supply and producing as output a cleaner, quieter supply voltage for the analog circuit. There are other potential uses of voltage regulators as well. In some cases, a voltage regulator may be placed serving the noisy circuit. The regulator provides the spikes and transient current and shields the overall supply voltage from these transients, allowing it to stay quieter to the benefit of all other circuits operating under it. In any case, a voltage regulator comprises a feedback loop that keeps an output voltage equal to some reference voltage that's provided. It controls the flow of current to the output through a pass transistor in order to regulate the output, which we'll call BREG. Here are some of the primary specifications of voltage regulators. First, the power supply rejection ratio. This measures the ratio of variations on the overall supply voltage, VDD, to variations in the output voltage, VREG. Notice that these quantities are small signal quantities, that is, their deviations in VDD and VREG away from their nominal values that can be thought of as small signal quantities or AC quantities. Power supply rejection is often expressed in dB and is a function of frequency. Sometimes you'll see rather than power supply rejection, you'll see a regulator specified in terms of its line regulation. This is essentially just the inverse of the power supply rejection ratio. That is, it's VREG over VDD. And usually it's just one number, which is that ratio measured at DC, whereas power supply rejection ratio is generally specified as a frequency response. The second regulator specification that will be of interest is its output impedance. This is also referred to in some cases as the regulator's load regulation. When it's reported as a load regulation, it's essentially just the output impedance measured at DC. Output impedance, of course, measures the ratio of fluctuations in output voltage to fluctuations in output current drawn. A third key specification that's particularly important in integrated circuit voltage regulators is its dropout voltage. This is the minimum difference that can appear between the voltage supplying the regulator, VDD, and its output regulated voltage, VREG. In general, VREG will have to be at a lower voltage than the supply VDD. And so this implies some waste or inefficiency in the regulator, as we'll see. Uh, so in many cases, we'd like to minimize this difference. So the dropout voltage is the minimum 
difference that we can have between VDD and VREG. A low dropout voltage implies energy efficient operation. And moreover, it allows a voltage regulator to operate even under a relatively low supply voltage and still provide a reasonable voltage of VREG for analog circuits to operate under. This gives rise to the common um, name low dropout regulator, which is a particular type of voltage regulator that is often required on analog or mixed signal integrated circuits with low supply voltage. We often just call these LDOs. Another important metric of voltage regulator performance is its efficiency. So here we see a general picture of a voltage regulator. The box here represents some transistor. It can be either PMOS or NMOS as we'll see. And I'll just use a generic symbol there for now. You'll see that its gate voltage is regulated by an op amp in a feedback loop. Assuming the loop is stable, we should have a virtual short circuit at the op amp's input so that the output VREG is approximately equal to the reference voltage provided to the regulator but with a low uh, with low noise and with the ability to source a significant amount of current whereas vref is probably being generated by some bias or reference circuit that is unable to supply the analog circuits load current il and the efficiency of the regulator is going to be the ratio of the power delivered to the load to the total power being consumed. The power delivered to the load is simply VREG times the current being supplied to the load analog circuit IL. Now let's think about the total power being dissipated here. Ultimately, all this current is coming from VDD. And let's think about what all the various uh, paths for current are. The load current is coming through this pass transistor and down into the analog circuit. There will be transient currents charging and discharging capacitor CL, but of course, the average on average there'll be zero current throwing, flowing through CL. So the other current that's flowing here is the current required to keep the op amp operating. It will have its own bias currents um, that flow directly from VDD uh, down, ultimately down to ground. These currents are referred to as quiescent currents. And they introduce a sort of wasted power consumption, which we can call the quiescent power of the regulator. So the total power being dissipated here is VDD times the load current and the quiescent current. So of this total power, some of it's being delivered to load and the rest is being dissipated in the regulator circuit itself. There's the quiescent power being dissipated in the op amp. And then there's also additional power being dissipated in the pass transistor itself. Because there's a current IL, flowing through a voltage drop across that pass transistor. That voltage drop is equal to VDD minus VREG. So these are the two sources of power being dissipated in the regulator itself. A perfectly efficient voltage regulator would have zero quiescent current and would have a very, very low dropout voltage. So that VDD minus VREG would be the smallest, its minimum and smallest possible voltage. That way, we would minimize the power being dissipated in the pass transistor. The regulator efficiency being the ratio 
of the power to the load over the total power. In that case, with IQ equal to zero and uh, VDD minus VREG equaling the dropout voltage would look like this. And IQ equals zero and VDD equals VREG plus VDO. The ILs cancel. I can just rewrite this one last time like this. And you see the expression clearly now. So this maximum possible efficiency is actually given by this expression here. This subscript should be VDD. So in summary, if we want to make the most efficient regulator possible, we want to minimize the quiescent current required to bias the op amp, and we'd like operation with low dropout voltage video. We'll see, however, that trying to meet these two requirements conflicts with the other specifications that we may wish to see, good supply voltage regulation and so on. In fact, the design of a voltage regulator is quite a challenge. Next, we'll consider the design of voltage regulators with two possible types of pass transistors. Here we see an NMOS pass transistor for Q1. Now, considering that the pass transistor has to carry all of the load current, keep in mind that it's quite likely a fairly large transistor. The more load current we require, the larger Q1 has to be. And this can create significant parasitics at its gate, identified here by C1. These capacitances load the op amp's output node. At the same time, we generally have a load capacitance CL introduced. This is an explicitly introduced capacitor that helps provide spikes in current required by the analog circuit. It's like a decoupling capacitor that you may be familiar with. It's a common practice whenever you want a quiet supply voltage to include a capacitor like this to help smooth out any bumps that arise in it. So we potentially have two large capacitances in this feedback loop, which can give rise to two fairly low frequency poles. This then can complicate stability of this feedback loop. It's not immediately obvious whether the time constant associated with this node or the one associated with this node should be dominant. Now, in the case of an NMOS transistor, the situation becomes a little bit simpler because the output impedance of transistor Q1 is hopefully low on the order of 1 over GM1. And so it's quite likely that the pole here can be made dominant. However, if it's desired to place a very large capacitance at the output, in order to provide very good decoupling of the regulator VREG. For example, this may be desired when the analog circuit is drawing particularly spiky current waveforms. And so the high frequency currents, uh, portions of the current IL can be provided by this large load capacitance. So in such cases, it may be desired to make the output pole dominant. In this case, the time constant associated with this node has to be pushed to a much higher frequency than the output pole. And this may generally require higher power consumption in the op amp and more quiescent current, therefore less efficiency, in order to ensure that the output uh, of the op amp has a lower output resistance. A good property of using the NMOS an NMOS device as a pass transistor Q1 is that once the feedback loop is stable, it's quite likely to have good power supply rejection. And that's 
just because if you imagine noise on the supply, that arrives at the drain of Q1 and doesn't therefore modulate the gate source voltage of Q1. And therefore, to first order approximation, shouldn't affect the current being sourced by Q1. Of course, Q1 will have a finite RDS and there will be some impact um, on that drain current due to the noise on VDD, but it will be uh, much less than the case where we uh, will have a PMOS transistor there. So the benefit of the NMOS pass transistor is that it generally has uh, good power supply rejection. The downside is that it's difficult to achieve a low dropout voltage with this structure because you've got to provide at least a VGS voltage drop here and then the op amp itself uh, has to therefore have a supply voltage even higher than the gate voltage of Q1. So this generally at least another V effective has to be provided between VDD and VG1. So um, from VDD all the way to VREG, it's quite likely that we have to allow for at least one threshold voltage uh, for Q1 plus two V effectives, one inside the op amp and one for Q1. So without any tricks, You're certainly looking at many hundreds of millivolts. So imagining a supply voltage of, let's say, only one volt, um, this kind of architecture may be very difficult to accommodate. There are a couple of techniques people have devised to try to make low dropout uh, regulators with uh, low supply voltage. One is to make use of a native, so-called native transistor for the NMOS pass transistor Q1 if it's available. Native transistors have very low threshold voltages, even equal to zero or sometimes even negative threshold voltages. So this will obviously help minimize the dropout voltage. Another technique is to use a different supply voltage for the op amp, a higher supply voltage for the op amp, but then a lower supply voltage over here, providing the load current IL. This, uh, this can also help reduce the dropout uh, voltage. Most of the current, remember, will be flowing from the drain of Q1. So the quiescent current flowing from the higher op amp supply voltage will have less of an impact on the regulator's efficiency than uh, the load current. Now, both of these techniques depend on you know what, what's possible in your particular design. Native transistors are only available in some CMOS technologies and a higher supply voltage may or may not uh, be available in your design. Shown here is the conventional so-called LDO architecture. It's a low dropout voltage regulator with a PMOS pass transistor. And with a PMOS pass transistor, the dropout voltage can be reduced significantly. We've only got to maintain a V effective here between VDD and VREG, and the gate voltage of Q1 is uh, far below VDD, so a regular op amp can provide it supplied from the same VDD. Let me just tidy that up a bit there, it's VGS. So um, the gate voltage of Q1 is a V effective plus threshold voltage below VDD. Um, so no problem generating that with a simple op amp. And uh, VREG can then be within a V effective of VDD. So dropout voltage in this case can be on the order of you know, 200 to even lower 
even as low as 100 millivolts in extreme cases. Now, again, you've still got the challenge of how to stabilize this uh, feedback loop. Again, there's two large capacitances here, and it's not clear which one should provide the dominant pole. Um, in addition, the PMOS LDO has much worse power supply rejection than the NMOS LDO. To see this, let's think about what happens if we introduce noise on BDD, some ripple there. If the gate voltage is being held relatively constant by the up amp and the feedback loop, then this output stage looks a lot like a common gate amplifier with respect to the noise at VDD. So in fact, Q1 would have a tendency to amplify supply noise at the output, which is the exact opposite of what we want. And the only reason it might not do that is because of the feedback action. Essentially, the op amp will sense those variations at VREG and adjust, hopefully adjust VGS accordingly. Right, so in a perfect world, the op amp would modulate the gate voltage of Q1 to precisely track time variations in VDD, keeping VGS1 constant. In doing so, it would keep the current flowing constant and thereby regulate the output voltage to very low noise. So th that's the premise of the voltage regulator, but obviously that's that tracking is only going to be possible within the bandwidth of the op amp. So in a sense, you can imagine that the regulator feedback loop here is really doing a lot of heavy lifting. It has to actively attenuate the uh, supply noise that's being introduced or amplified by Q1. This is very different than the NMOS pass transistor, where the output stage on its own would just passively attenuate supply noise and have its own supply rejection because um, you know it, the, no, the supply noise you know, with an NMOS pass transistor is appearing at the drain of Q1. So already we have an intuitive understanding that the requirement here is for the op amp to have a high bandwidth, high enough bandwidth to track any supply noise that uh, we might see on BDD. This, uh, can be a challenge, especially considering that the load that the op amp has to drive is a fairly large gate capacitance here, C1. Um, moreover, C1 in this case also includes any Miller capacitance associated with Q1, which looks like a common source stage um, as far as the, uh, as the op amp goes. So let's consider the analysis of the feedback loop in the LDO a little bit more carefully. Here we've made a small signal model of the PMOS voltage regulator. We've replaced the op amp with a, a first order OTA or single stage OTA model that has an amplifier transconductance capital GMA and an output resistance ROA. It's driving the uh, capacitance, the gate capacitance of Q1. Model for Q1 appears here. Where we've got uh, its small signal transconductance GM1. Uh, and at the same time, uh, RDS1 is lumped in down here with any load uh, impedance. Uh, this node here is the supply voltage BDD, which serves as a small signal ground. And then feedback comes from VREG back to the op amp's positive terminal. So in order to study the loop gain L, we break the loop here and we introduce a test source VT. And it's the, the analysis of L in this case is relatively simple because we've just got two single time constant stages here. We've got the single time constant here, 
formed by the output resistance of the op amp and the capacitance at uh, V1. Let's call this C1 prime, where C1 prime is really the parallel combination of all the capacitances connected at V1. And then we've got a second time constant arising at the output, which um, is really just RL prime and CL. So these two single time constant responses give rise to two poles. One is we'll call omega PA. That's the one at the output of the amplifier. The eight reminds us of that. And that's just one over time constant one. The second pole um, is the one that arises at the output, at the load. That's one over our time constant two that we identified. And the overall loop response L just has these two poles and the DC gain in the numerator. Now the straightforward option here is dominant pole compensation, where one of these poles is at a much lower frequency than the other. But again, it's not obvious which of these two poles is going to be dominant. C1 prime is generally going to be large in order to permit Q1 to deliver a decent amount of load current. And at the same time, it's likely that we want CL to be large to help us filter supply noise from the rig at high frequencies. So it's not clear whether it's better to make this pole dominant or the output pole dominant. Now, in order to understand the choice that we make about how to compensate this loop, it's important to look at the impact of that choice on the supply rejection of the LDO. So here's a small signal circuit that will allow us to analyze the supply rejection. We've, in this case, introduced an AC source on the supply, shown here, VDD. So this represents small time variations in the supply voltage, and we're interested in the frequency response from there to the output of the regulator, VREG. Now, the way we're going to find that is to find the response from VDD to VREG with the loop broken. And that is simply going to be the response of the common gate stage. that is provided by Q1 with respect to supply noise. And then we're going to divide that by 1 plus L, because when we close the loop, um, that you know, uh, introduces the 1 plus L term in the denominator, where we've already found L on the last slide. Now, with the loop open, the common gate amplifier response is pretty straightforward. It's just got a single time constant formed here at the output. Now I'll call it RL prime because we have to consider RL in parallel with RDS1. And uh, that's with load cap there. So it's a single time constant response with the loop broken and the DC gain is simply GM1 RL. Actually, I believe there should be a plus sign here. So again, this is not good because, you know, if we think of the magnitude response of this common gate stage, it's actually got gain GM1. RL prime. That might be a gain of 10 dB or much more even um, up to this output pole, one over tau identified here. So we're relying on the one plus L term in the denominator here 
when we close the loop to help knock that down and give us some good supply rejection. Knock it down, not just to zero dB, but again, remember the whole point of the regulator is that it should actually attenuate supply noise. So we want to have the magnitude of this term here being much larger than the DC gain of the common gate stage, um, all the way up to, you know, beyond the bandwidth of this common gate stage, beyond this pole at one over tau. So on this slide, we're putting this all together to find the uh, supply rejection response of the low dropout regulator. And uh, this will hopefully reveal the design trade-offs that we're interested in. So here again, we've just sketched the plot of the magnitude response, the common gate stage with loop open. We see it's DC gain GM1 RL prime. And here we're plotting um, the magnitude of one over one plus L. So at DC, right, the loop gain L included both the common source stage gain, which is really the same as the gain of the common gate stage, uh, times the DC gain of the op end. So that'll be good. This term here then is, uh, you know, one over one plus L at DC is uh, effectively going to equal one over L. And that's going to be small enough. It's going to be much less than one so that when we multiply it here, GM1 times RL will cancel, right? And we'll just end up with one over the op amp DC gain, which will be a very good supply rejection at DC. This makes sense because at DC, the loop is working. We're well within the op amp's loop bandwidth. So the op amp will be able to track variations in VDD very, very well and regulate the output voltage. But then at omega P1, that's the dominant pole of L, we'll see that the loop gain will start to decrease. And remember, there's two possibilities for the dominant pole of L. So we're not sure where this dominant pole will be, but we'll just call it omega P1 for now. So then the loop gain will start to degrade and one over L therefore will start to increase. So, and then this will continue until we hit the unity gain frequency of L. So beyond that frequency, then L becomes less than unity. So in one over one plus L, the unity term in the denominator becomes dominant. And this just becomes flat at unity at uh, high frequencies. So that will mean that beyond the unity gain frequency of the loop, effectively, this term is just equal to one. And it's not going to attenuate the common gate response at all. Again, this makes sense because at high frequencies, basically the loop's not working. So um, the response from VDD to the output is just out of the common gate stage itself. So the key point, what we see, what we see now is that we want to make sure that omega P1 is high enough or that, you know, and omega T are, are both high enough so that we are still in this high loop gain region while the common gate stage is amplifying supply noise. So the better scenario in terms of power supply rejection is therefore if we make the dominant pole omega P1 of the loop equal to the output pole at the load, omega PL. If we do that, it turns that omega P1 coincides with this frequency. So we've got uh, power supply rejection or just equal to one over the op amp gain at DC. And when we hit the dominant pole omega P1, then the common gate response starts rolling off at the exact same time as the one over one plus L term starts decrease, uh, increasing. So the two cancel each other out and this remains, you know, we keep this flat, approximately flat, supply rejection all the way up to omega t when we hit the unity gain frequency of the loop then um, this term in the power supply rejection changes slope that slope decreases by 20 db per decade and the power supply starts rolling off even further so again qualitatively what's going on in this scenario well the output pole is dominant so again right where um you know, the, the op amp is, the op amp's bandwidth is sufficient 
to overcome the common gate gain of Q1 and keep very good power supply rejection until we get to omega T. And at omega T, what happens is the load cap CL kicks in and um, uh, starts even further attenuating supply noise. So we've got a very good supply rejection ratio over all frequencies. The other possibility for power supply rejection is shown here on the right. Now, in this case, we make the dominant pole, the one at the pass transistor gate, V1. So in this case, it means that mega P1 arises at, at the gate of Q1 at a lower frequency than the load pole. So this term is still high at GM1 times RL, and this term at omega P1 starts increasing. So the power supply rejection, therefore, goes from being one over the op amp gain and starts actually increasing at omega PA. And it keeps increasing until we get to the unity gain frequency of the loop, at which point it flattens until we get to the second pole frequency, which is omega PL. Once we get to the second pole frequency, then again, the effect of the decoupling load cap CL kicks in, and then that starts helping to regulate, you know, that, that filtering cap is only helpful at high enough frequencies beyond omega PL, and then it starts helping and improving the supply rejection again. So this is generally a, a, a dangerous situation for the LDO because it's it's just not clear how high this peak will be. It depends on the relative location of omega T and uh, omega PA. But by definition, omega T needs to be a you know a fair bit higher than the dominant pole omega P1 in order to have good um, in order to have good stability of the loop. So we've probably got quite a large frequency separation here. Moreover, the second pole we know should be at or usually beyond the unity gain frequency of the loop. So it means that, you know, really this peak can go quite high. And in some cases, in a poorly designed LDO, will actually cause the supply rejection to go, um, to become worse than zero dB. That is, it will actually be amplifying supply noise. That would obviously be a poorly designed LDO and people have come up with lots of clever tricks to avoid that. But between these two, the preferable situation is clearly the one on the left here where the dominant pole it arises at the load. The problem is that implies that the second pole of the loop has to be the pole at the amplifier output, omega PA. And again, in order to make that pole a very high frequency, we're going to have to consume a lot of power in the op amp, a lot of quiescent power. If you think about it, I mean, um, that's the exact opposite situation of what we usually see in a two-stage op amp. Two-stage op amp where the second stage is a common source stage, usually it's the Miller cap of that second stage that gives rise to a dominant pole at the internal node, which in this case would be analogous to V1. But here we're saying that for an LDO, in order to have good supply rejection, we'd like the output node to be the dominant pole of the two-stage amplifier here. And so that's a kind of difficult scenario um, to realize. So this, these are, this, is the, this is the inherent trade-offs in the design of an LDO to combine stability and sufficient phase margin alongside good supply rejection ratio across all frequency and at the same time, keeping hopefully high efficiency, that is low quiescent power consumed in the op amp. We see that combining all three of these requirements is, is quite difficult.